Thank you for tuning in today. We're so glad that you've joined us as we're ministering in hundreds of homes today. And praise God, what a wonderful age for the church to be in. I know that some people will look at this and say, wow, I would rather be at church. You know, it would be great for us to be together gathered. Um, but I believe that God is moving us out of our comfort zones. God wants us to be able to reach those who are all around us. What better way to do that than if you will just go ahead and share this with somebody who would need a word of encouragement. We're going to continue in our series as we've been talking about rising up. God desires us to rise up. He doesn't want us to stay in the same place that we were born into. God wants us to be in a place where we are changed where we're made in his image. Uh, to, to, he's calling us back to that place where he created us in his likeness and in his image, where sin has separated us. Sin, the fall caused man, we learned about that last week, fall, the, the fall caused man to be separated from God. But God is calling us today. There is a yearning inside of the hearts of people for something that is truly transcendent that is beyond ourselves and I want to challenge you today as we are going to talk today a little bit about our identity as well and really what our name is I want to really get right into the message so if you will turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 32 and we're going to read verses 24 through 31 and this is what it says and Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was pulled out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name. And he said, Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Lord, or he asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask me my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Penael, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose up upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Now, if you will, re read with me a passage out of Revelations chapter 2, verse 17. And this is what it says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on it, the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. I, I want to talk today about your identity and understanding your name and understanding the power of a name, the power of your identity. And maybe uh, to illustrate this, I want to I share with you the, that, uh, the power of a name, the power of a word, the power when you hear something or when you see something cognitively, how your mind reacts. And there was a study done by this German psychologist, Wolfgang Kobler, uh, and he suggests that words convey symbolic ideas beyond their meaning. To test the idea more carefully, he had a group of respondents decide which of the two shapes that he drew out Below was a Maluma, and which one was a Takiti? Now look at here. You see this picture? Which one do you think is a Maluma, and which one do you think is a Takiti? If you're like the vast majority of Kohler's uh, respondents, you're compelled by the idea that the Malumas are the soft and rounded like the shape on the left, whereas the taquitis are sharp and jagged like the one on the right. 
As Kohler showed, words carry hidden baggage that may play at, at least some role in the shaping of your thoughts. What's surprising, perhaps, is how profoundly a single word can shape the material outcomes over time is what the study said. It, it, it shapes your outcomes over time. Those words have power. The words have an influence. Uh, just this morning, I was uh, playing with Josiah, and we were talking. Uh, he was wanting to uh, play with his babies, and, and he asked for me, and I said, yeah, buddy. And he said, not buddy, Josiah, because he wanted me to share his name. He identifies himself by his name. He didn't want to be called Buddy. He wanted to be called Josiah because Josiah is his name. The, just like many of us, we have names that are bestowed upon us. You know, we all have a name that was bestowed upon you. Maybe some of you here listening today, your name is John, and we have plenty of Johns in our church, and your name carries with it, it was your parents who, who named you John. Maybe you had an uncle named John. Maybe you had an aunt, na uh, not an aunt. <laughs> Maybe you had a grandfather named John. May maybe some of you, your name is Angela. We have a ton of Angelas in our church. Church. And if you're an Angela and you don't attend our church, I encourage you to come out. You'll find an Angela here as well. And, and maybe it was your great grandmother who was named Angela. And so you have that name. It was bestowed upon you by your parents. It, it designates who you are in that family because when they call your name, they're talking to you. They, it was designated as an indicator of you amongst all of the other children or in your family. We all have also a last name, and that surname is actually the indicator of our family line. And so we have, uh, we may have somebody here today, and your last name is uh, Garcia, and that's a very common household name in Latin American countries. And there's tons of Garcias in a Latin home. You know, Garcias they're everywhere. Maybe in in here in America, another very common last name is Jones, and and those last names names indicate your family lineage, where you came from. It, 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 it applies to all of the people in your complete family unit, your aunts, your uncles, your, your nieces, your nephews, your, your, your backstory, your heritage uh, is involved in that name. That name identifies your family line. And, and for some, you might have a very identifying family line. Uh, maybe your last name is McDonald. And, and you like Happy Meals, I don't know, but you, you're McDonald and, and you know that because you carry the McDonald name, you have some Scottish inside of you. It's very particular, uh, that last name. It, it identifies your backstory and it, it takes you back to that family line. There are also names, excuse me, uh, we have those last names, the first names. Then we have status names. Our status names are, are more like the titles. And for some of you, you might have earned your doctorate. And, and you, you wear that name proudly. I'm doctor. Uh, I'm doctor this. I have a doctorate in psychology. I have a doctorate in philosophy. I have a doctorate in religion. And, and you, you have that doctorate. Or, or for some of you, your, your status name, is teacher and people identify you as Mrs. So-and-so or Mr. So-and-so, my teacher, and, and your identity is wrapped up in your name. And for some of you, you served in the military and you have a that name of status as well. Maybe some of you were a sergeant. And for me, I was a petty officer. And so here I was a non-commissioned officer. For, I know we have a general in our church and, and his title title is general. And so that name identified his ability to advance the ranks, to, to get to that place where the status was 
where you finally ended up, your rank. We have names not just of status, but we also have names of reputation. And so here, here are some names of reputation. You, you might have been called very honest. You're, you're, you're known in your family as the honest one. Uh, if, if I'm going to get the truth out of somebody, I'm going to go to the honest person. I'm not going to go to the liar. We all have that family member that we know. They're going to embellish things a little bit. But maybe you were the maybe you were the honest one. Maybe some of you here today, you were the Debbie Downer. You know who the Debbie Downer is? Always looking at the glass half empty. You're always, oh my, Eeyore is your other name. You know, woe is me. And maybe some of you, you know, you have this name of reputation and it's very negative and you have this name of reputation as thief. Maybe you've done things in your past and people associate you with the things that you did in your past because you thought took things from people. Maybe some of you were the opposite. You, you were just the person that everybody goes to all the time to get something, and you have that status name of giver. You're a giver. You love to give. You love to help other people. And maybe some of you here today, you're struggling with that other identity name, and, and that name is addict. And maybe you're too addicted to your telephone. Maybe you're addicted to a substance. Uh, maybe you're addicted to pornography and you're dealing with the title of that that uh, reputation of an addict today and, and that has been carried on inside of you you know and on top of having those names of reputation, we also have the names of affection. So, you know, some of you here today, you have, uh, you are the, uh, you are honey. Yeah, my wife, I call wife honey sometimes. Don't do it very often. I usually call her baby or Joanne or sweetie, and I've got that one right here. You know, some of you are, you, you have that name, sweetie, and some of you don't like that name, but your, your significant other does call you that name. Or, you know, some of you are just too cool, too cool, and you just call your significant other Bay, you know, <laughs> hey Bay, I just or Boo is the other one, you know that 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 name. Maybe some of you just you know that loved one kind of has that pet name, and you hate it. Crazy, hey crazy, how you doing? Yeah, we all have these names, these labels that we're all carrying with us, don't we? You see, culture tells us that we must make a name for ourselves. And psychologists say identity is largely self-chosen. However, the truth is that we're seeking affirmation and approval, and our identity is not always self-chosen. Rather, it's imposed upon us because of all of the things that we're going through and all the things that we are seeking. I want to impact your thoughts this morning. I want to impact your thoughts concerning the name that God has for you. Uh, deep down inside, we need a name bestowed and not just earned. I need someone of significance to tell me what my name is. I don't need to have a label imposed upon me by someone who is not significant in my life. That's why, listen, that's why there are over 26 million people who have done DNA testing uh, around the world because they have sought identity in their last name and in their DNA. They want to connect with someone from their ancestry, from their past. There's a longing inside of us. I'm not saying that going to Ancestry.com or, or 23andMe or any of these other services that are out there is bad. It, it, what it is, it's just it, telling and revealing of the identity issue that we're all striving with, that we're all struggling with. And so I want to I really go back to what we're talking about today. I want to talk about who we are and how do we rise up to be the people that God has called us to be. I, I was watching a movie the other day with Joanne. 
And as we're watching this movie, it was called Lion. It was about a, a boy named Saru in India. And he was, uh, he was with his brother. Uh, they had gone to do a day labor, uh, actually o- over a weekend. He gets on a train uh, with his brother. His brother, they reach their final destination. Saru is very tired and he stays at the train station. He winds up getting locked up in a train that is being dis- decommissioned. Uh, ends up thousands of miles from home. Winds up in an orphanage is adopted, taken to Australia in his 20s. This is based on a true story. I know I'm giving it away. Uh, it's all right. <laughs> uh, if I spoiled it, I'm sorry. But you, you'll get the gist of this. So he gets to, he gets to Australia and he, he's going to college and something inside of him starts stirring for where his, his story goes, starts back from. So he's going on Google Maps and he's searching for uh, this area of the world, the back, the plains where he remembers growing up. And he finally finds the place where his family's at. He travels to where he's, his family is at. He, after 20 years, he reconnects with his mom. Come to find out when he gets to where his mom is... She, he, he, she reveals to him that his name is not really Saru. He, he had a speech, a slight speech impediment. His name was actually Sheru. And Sheru means lion. And he was like, like a lion. He finally gets to the place that he calls home. All of his life seeking for identity, seeking who he was. And he finds out he is a lion. And I want to tell you, that's where we're at today. There's something on the inside of us that draws us to find out who we really are. That we are the lions, that we are the kings, that we are the queens that God has called us to be. You see, I want to challenge you today. I want you to stand up, touch your neighbor right where they're at and say, boo, or no, don't call them boo. Say, hey, baby, or, or maybe even, hey, son. Hey, daughter, God has something for you. God has a name. Tell them right now, I have a name for you. Text your neighbor. Hey, God has a name for you. Hey, and it's not a bad name. It is good name. God has a good name in store for you. God has a plan and a purpose and a destiny. And as we look at this story, I love this story because it, it really kind of gets us to that place where we're at in this, in this progression of our series. We, we talked about uh, the how we're inconsistent inside, that there's a battle that rages within us that, that calls us to something more eternal, something that is of God, and yet we have the flesh that we're fighting, and so there's that, there's that inconsistency inside. Then we talked about how God has, has, uh, has made us new, that if anyone is in Christ, listen, he has made us a new creation. He wants to create in us his, what he intended, what he desired what he designed as we learned last week that what he did in the garden of even eden when he breathed life into man was to breathe his breath into man to create something beautiful but sin came in and sin divided us sin broke us from that relationship that god had from a perfect relationship And sin divided us and brought us to the place where now we are struggling to find our identity and our self-worth. But you want to know something? God accepts you. God loves you. God has a plan for you in Christ Jesus. So when we look at these verses of Scripture, I want to challenge you to think about this. So it says that Jacob was left alone. Listen, who was Jacob? Do you understand the story of Jacob? You need to know the backstory of the story of Jacob. Jacob's own name means deceiver or supplanter. Uh, he was the one who grabbed the heel of his brother Esau. And his entire life was one of him always striving, seeking acceptance, seeking the approval of his brother, seeking the approval of his father. Um, constantly warring within his own self and and he was always deceptive in doing what he needed to do in order to get to where he wanted to be so the story is of course that he steals the birthright from his brother 
Esau. And so his brother is about to kill him. He flees. He goes into the wilderness. Uh, he sees a vision of God coming, uh, angels coming down on Jacob's ladder, as you guys may have heard of Jacob's ladder. Up and down, the angels come, and, and, and he's there. He has an encounter with God. Uh, he asks God, just like what we tend to do, hey, God, why don't you show up? Why don't you bless me? Why don't you do something inside of me? Why don't you, why don't you uh, change my outcomes? Uh, if you do that, I will give you my whole life. And, and he makes a plan with God, and he leaves that place, and he goes out, he builds a business, a successful business, uh, does really well, and, and there's a yearning inside of him to come back to home, to, to deal with his identity issue, to deal with the power of his own name. The, the fact that he's been called Jacob his whole life. Listen, that name had influence in his life. It had negative repercussions in his life. Just like any name that you're wearing today has an influence in your life. Listen, it, no, it doesn't. You're not held back by your past, but I can tell you your past is going to influence. If you allow it to, it will influence the outcomes of your future. And that name had so much power and so much negative influence. Look, look at the world around us today. Uh, I mean, all you got to hear is the word COVID-19. And now all of you are jumping back on your phones, trying to find out what the latest news is. How many people have passed away? What, where, how is it going to affect us? And, and we're constantly moved by the name, a name, the power of a name. And so Jacob is being sifted in his life and he's being shaken and, and finally he comes to that recognition that he needs to go back. He needs to go back. So on the road back to his brother, on the road back to his home, God confronts him, but he's alone. He's in a quiet place. He's in that place of solitude, where we are in that quiet place, alone with God, matters. Listen, Jacob is left alone with God. He's left alone with God. He's no longer fighting with his brother. He's no longer fighting with his father. He's no longer fighting to make it on his own. He's no longer fighting to, to accumulate things, to, to finally be a, considered a success. He is alone with God. I want to ask you today, is God real to you when you are alone? Is God real to you when you are left with nothing else? When all the music has stopped? When all the gatherings have quit, when it's just you and God, I want to ask you, are you used to being alone with God? See, we've, the world has pushed paused on us. This is an opportunity for us to finally get alone with God. Why? Because your true identity is found when you get alone with God. When you turn off the music, listen, I'm all for having Hillsong worship, for us listening to some Bethel music, for us to, to have some times of some, some corporate worship. But I want to tell you, if you have not gotten alone with God on the day when you pass on, and listen, death is 100 out of 100. It's a 100% guarantee. We are all going to die one day. On that day, will it be the first day that you're alone with God? Hmm. I hope not. I hope that you've cultivated times when you have actually had an encounter, a living encounter, a real encounter, not an experiential created encounter. Listen, we're good in the church of creating experiences, and I, and, and, and I think we need to do that. But at the same time, we must seek real, quiet experiences with God. And that can't happen in a corporate worship service. Our corporate worship services are for us to continue to lift each other up, to, to support one another, to build each other up. 
But it, listen, it's in those times of quiet reflection with God that God begins to reveal things inside of you. If you are stripped away with the music, with the TV, with the internet, the traditions, the people, are you afraid to be alone with God? When you die, listen, I pray it's not the first time that you have had a quiet time with God. That's why, that's why Revelations Listen, the writer says, to those who overcome, he says, to those who overcome, I will give some of the hidden manna. Jesus is called the manna or the bread of life. He is the manna of God. And listen, what what he is really reminding us here is that we need to know how to feast on Christ in the secret places when no one is watching, when no one is clapping for you, when no one is celebrating you, that you have something of substance, something that is real, something that is experienced experience with you and God when Christ comes into your life. Number two, your identity is found at the end of your struggle with God. For Jacob, he spent his entire life wrestling. He and his entire life was wrestling. He was wrestling with his brother. He was wrestling with his father. He was wrestling with his uncle later on. He discovers All along, the truth is that he has been wrestling not with his brother, not with his father. All those things were just symptomatic of the real struggle that he had. He was really wrestling with God. He was wrestling with his identity, with God. You think that your fight is against your company you think your fight is against your spouse. You, you, oh my goodness, my spouse this and my spouse, my kids, oh, I can't believe. You, we constantly keep putting the onus on others and saying that our fight is with them. But re- in reality is that our fight is not against all of those people, all of those things, all of those circumstances. Our fight really is, our wrestling, what we're wrestling with really is with control and are we ceding control to God have we left ourselves at the foot of Jesus and say God no longer I but you in me listen what you're really struggling who you're really struggling with is with God number three God slowed him down God had to slow him down so that he could face the reality that he wasn't in control. And for many of us, that's where we're at today. Listen, I can't, I don't know why God allowed this global pandemic. We all, we can, we can sit here and, and, and give all kinds of theories and, and, and do all kinds of juxtapositioning concerning why, how, when, when will it all end. But I want to I impress upon you that it's not about the who, what, when, why, how of all of this pandemic. Who are you clinging to at this time? You see, at that point of his struggle, Jacob is struggling, he is wrestling, and then, listen, what happens really just messes up our theology. God hurts him. I know know some of you are like, oh, pastor, I just tuned you off. God would never hurt me. But listen, God will slow you down. God allows opportunities for him to slow you down so that you can get to that place where you let him take control. All of, all of his life, Jacob was adept to running. He would run away from God. He would run away from his family. He ran away from his troubles. He ran, he ran away. Everything was about running away. And when he was finally faced with the reality that he was not in actual control, God slowed him down and he realizes that his struggle hasn't been with his brothers. His struggle wasn't about his decisions. His struggle wasn't about the labels of his past. His struggle was with God. 
and that he needed to slow down and let God take control. Revelations 2, verse 17 says, I will give him a white, a white stone. I will give him a white stone, one with a new name written on it, on that stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. In that culture, uh, the white stone had symbolism with the court of law. Judge and jury would gather and all the evidence was presented against you. We live in a courtroom of approval today. Many of us, we're struggling because we're trying to find acceptance from our family, acceptance from our friends, acceptance in our jobs. We're trying to climb the corporate ladder. We're trying to find the approval of people, of places, of things. We're always seeking approval. And if you were found guilty in that culture, as they would present the sentence to you, they would give you a black stone. That was your sentence. That was the courtroom of approval, of disapproval. However, if you were acquitted of your crime, you were given a white stone. And now with that white stone, those things from the past would no longer be held against you. They were thrown away. Huh. Jesus gives us a white stone. Listen, this is exactly what Jacob goes through in his life. God finally talks to him and he says what's your name and Jacob says well my name is deceiver my name is supplanter my name is liar my name is thief he, he tells him my name is and God stops him he says your name no longer is deceiver your name is Israel for you have striven with God you have fought the good fight you have over Come, your name is overcomer. L listen to that. He says, your name is overcomer. Listen, God has called you an overcomer today. He has handed you a white stone. Ha. He had to crush his hip in order to get him to that place. But man, I'll tell you, when he finally came to that utter place of utter dependence on God, ha, he finally understood who he was. He hands him the stone and he gives him a name. Listen, the collection of our own blessings, the things that we've tried to accumulate in this life will never suffice. We just need God's blessing and God's approval. Maybe today you have fought with that name. Maybe today you're standing here today. You're sitting right there on your couch. And you say, well, I was, I was a crazy one. Or, you know what, I'm, I was the fixer. And I, I'm tired of being the one who's constantly fixing everybody's problems. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I'm the one who's carrying this family and you're carrying all of these names on you, and you just can't handle it anymore. God has a name for you. God wants to change your name. He wants to give you a stone that reflects the name that he is calling you. Listen, he did it in the past. He did it with Abraham. He did it with Jacob. He did it with Peter who was once called Simon. <laughs> that word Simon means to listen. He was a listener. Well, we know he wasn't always a very good listener. And maybe that's why they called him that. But God says, no, you're no longer going to be called the listener who doesn't listen. You're going to be called the rock. And upon you will I build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Saul went through that identity as well as he was standing there at the, at the stoning of Stephen. And when he gives his life, to his, his life to Christ, he himself recognizes he's no longer Saul, which means asked for, but he, he himself bestows upon himself the name Paul, his, Roman, his Romanized name, meaning little, less of me, God, and more of you. Listen, we had a friend, we had a guy in our church down in South Florida, 
He had been through it. He had he he wore the label. He had worn the labels over his life. Addict, deceiver. He was going to change his name. So he went and actually filed for a name change, appeared before a judge, and he changed his name to listen to this. Happy, happy. Wow. Now, I'm not suggesting that you guys go to the courthouse and change your name, but here's what I am suggesting. I'm suggesting that you start removing the labels, the labels that you've been carrying, those things that you are constantly putting before God and saying, God, I'm tired, I'm tired of this, that today you start looking for the name that only God can give you. Listen what would happen in that culture as God had a secret name that is intimate to him only. The, in that ancient culture, this is what people would do. The ancients would go out into the desert. They would remove all of the labels of their name and they would go into hidden places, little caves throughout the desert and they would seek God's face. They would listen for God's voice because what they wanted to be called was the name that God had for them. Tired of peeling the names of culture and of their circumstance and of the past. They sought God for the only name that God had for them. You say, Pastor, I don't know Can you tell me what my name is? I don't know what your name is before God. Only God can give you a new name. A name unlike any name. A name that is befitting of who you are in Him. But you've got to get alone with Him. You've got to strive with Him. You've got to fight the good fight. Overcome on the other side and stand at the place of utter dependence on him. Will you pray with me? With every eye closed and every head bowed. Heavenly Father, I seek your identity today, laying aside all of the names that I have been given in this life. I seek you. I seek your approval I stop seeking the approval of my bosses, my spouse, my coworkers, my family. And I start seeking your approval today. Which is why Jesus said, I forsake, if anyone is not willing to forsake mother and father for me. Lord, we forsake those things. Not saying that we don't need them, that we don't want them. We're saying that today we pursue the name above all names. The name that comes when Christ works in us. So we surrender today. If this is your first time, if this is your first time with an encounter with Christ, or maybe you've fallen away You've backslidden and you've done your own thing. And today you're hearing this message and you say, I need to get back to Christ. Will you pray this prayer with me? Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Wash me and cleanse me and make me whole. Come and live in my heart and give me a new name. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.